Well, Kevin, welcome to Core Connections. I'm so, so excited. I have been really excited to have this chat with you today because I know you have so much incredible information to share with my audience that really could change your life. I say that a lot, but I, I really, I always truly mean it because it's always amazing that sometimes the littlest piece of information can really be life-changing, right? So Kevin, let's go ahead and start. I want you to just tell everybody more about you. How did you get started on this journey specializing in osteopenia and osteoporosis one because you're pretty young and two because you're a guy like those two things don't usually fall into that conversation I know right yeah usually it's not the male the younger male that's told they have osteoporosis usually it is the woman and uh yeah for me my own personal journey started when I was a lot younger when my mother was five months pregnant with me, my father was told he had cancer. Two months after I was born, he passed away. He was 35 years old at that time. And my entire life, I, I went through my life and I had this fear that I was just going to follow down that path to an early grave and not be there for my kids and experience the joys of being a father. And when I had gone into the Marine Corps, right after I got out, I started having all these different health issues and I had poor sleep high stress. I had digestive issues, loose stools. And the next thing you know, I'm diagnosed with celiac disease. And then I was subsequently diagnosed with osteoporosis. And oh my gosh. I, at, at that point, you know, being right around 30 years old, being told I had osteoporosis, I was shocked. I got a letter in the mail that said, Hey, you have osteoporosis, go on a gluten-free diet. That was the extent of the recommendation that I got. And I realized I already knew there was more to it than that. But when I started Googling what is osteoporosis and what does this mean for my future, it said fractures and medication dependence were the two biggest things that I took away from that. And that was not going to cut it for me. So I went down this path of reading and research and consulting with people and spending a lot of money trying to figure all this stuff out. And I finally started getting the right plan in place for improving my health and my bones. And not just that, for being there for my kids and for wanting to be there uh, and be a father. So uh, I ended up becoming a health coach because I realized all the things that I'm learning it's not really the male that's 30 years old that's trying to figure this out. It's the woman 50 to 65 plus or the mother or something like that, that they're having these issues and they're presented with four options. Take some calcium, some vitamin D, go for a walk. Here's a bone medication and we'll see you in a year for your next bone density scan. And that is woefully inadequate. And oftentimes it's just not the right approach. So uh, I ended up building out these uh, this program, brought in some credentialed experts, and the program uh, at Bone Coach, we've been featured in Forbes and have these programs that have helped people in over 1,500 cities around the world, over 100,000 people in our community. And it's just amazing to see the the impact and the interest in improving people's bones. No, it's amazing. And this is why you're here talking today, because you you are changing lives, which is awesome. So let's talk about, just to clarify for everyone listening, what is osteoporosis and what is, and osteopenia, I should put them the other way. What's osteopenia and then what is osteoporosis since osteopenia happens before osteoporosis? Just so everyone really understands the difference between the two and what they are, if they don't know. Yeah, so I mean, osteoporosis literally means porous bone. And it's a condition that's characterized by either not enough bone formation, excessive bone loss, or it's a combination of the two of those things. And in osteoporosis, both your bone density and your bone quality are reduced, and that's going to increase your risk of fracture. Now, the way you find out you have osteoporosis or osteopenia, and we'll talk about that in a second, is through what's called a bone density scan. And that's a DEXA scan, so dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. Painless test, kind of like an x-ray, very low levels of radiation. You lay down on the machine, it does a scan, and then it tells you your bone mineral density, the actual mineral content of your bone. And then what it does is it generates a score. And that score is called the T-score. And the T-score is comparing your bone density to that of a healthy, approximately 30-year-old adult. If you've got a score of plus one or minus one, 
uh, uh, somewhere in between there, that's considered normal and healthy. If you've got a minus one to in between a minus 2.5, that's considered osteopenia, what we would call low bone mass, which is like a precursor to osteoporosis. And minus 2.5 or lower, minus 2.6, minus 2.7, so on and so forth, that's considered osteoporosis. The greater that negative number becomes, the more severe the osteoporosis. Most people, and this is really important, are getting these bone density scans later in life, in their 50s or 60s or 70s. That's the first time they're ever getting them. But we need to get them much younger so we have an objective piece of data showing us where we're at. We need to have that baseline from which to monitor future changes. So if you're listening to this and you're you know, in your late 20s or your 30s or your 40s, or, uh, and you haven't had a bone density scan, go get one. So you have an objective piece of data. And then if your mother or your grandmother, or if you yourself are in your 50s or 60s or 70s, and you're listening, and you haven't had one, request one, go get it. So how often should women be retesting? It probably, it depends a little probably on what their initial results are. Um, well, bone density scans are going to be done approximately every one to two years or so. And the reason for that is that bone remodeling is a slow process. It's not going to happen overnight. And these changes aren't going to be really quick. And the changes that you can see in a given time period that are going to be meaningful using a bone density scan would be about a one to two year period. So that's the reason why you would get them every one to two years. Now, there are when you get that bone density scan, it's not telling you if you're still actively losing bone right now. A single bone density scan can't tell you that. So what can tell you that are what are called bone turnover markers. And there's something called a CTX, that's the serum CTX or CT low peptide, that's what it's called. And it looks at the activity level of cells that are breaking down bone. If that activity level is elevated or even really high, that can be an indicator of active bone loss and a root cause issue that needs to be addressed. So if we're talking about lagging indicators of success or improvement or loss, that would be a bone density scan. If we're talking about leading indicators of success, it would be the objective serum CTX results and, and seeing those come down in a three to six month period. Okay. So if someone's just starting to say it's like someone who's like 40 years old, I've never done one, but after hearing and learning so much more from you, I'm like, I should probably go get one just to see where I'm at. So should I do a DEXA scan and the go ahead and do the lab work as well? So you have both of them. That was what I would think we wish we should do. So we have a starting point. So we know where we're at. And then if something shows up, then we can take the actions we need to take from there. And then retesting obviously is going to be dependent on upon what your labs come back at. Yep. I would totally agree with that. Um, you okay. get them both at the same time, get your lab work done at the same time. You get your bone density scan uh, done and or very close to that time doesn't need to be exact, but at least then you have some objective data as a baseline so you can monitor future changes. I love it. This is such good stuff. Okay. So Kevin, I know you've got some re really crazy stats about osteoporosis that I want you to share with everyone. Because when I heard you say these, I was shocked. Yeah, I mean, we've got approximately, if we're just talking about the US even, yeah. not even focusing on globally, it's a much bigger issue, but approximately 10 million Americans have osteoporosis, another 44 million have low bone density. One in two women and up to one in four men will break a bone in their lifetime due to osteoporosis. And for women, the incidence of having low bone density is greater than that of heart attack, stroke, and breast cancer combined. And then if we're talking about, okay, so what does that really mean? Well, if we have a fracture, the stats around that are six months after a hip fracture, only 15% of patients can walk across a room unaided. And then every year, we've got about 300,000 hip fracture patients. Okay. And a quarter of those people end up in nursing homes and half of them never regain their previous function. So 
if you're listening to this and even if it's not an issue for you right now, or you don't think it's like this immediate near-term thing, you still need to be thinking about, you know, your future. How far out are you thinking? Because the, the actions that you're taking today, the way you live your life today will show up in your later years. So you may hear this talk about longevity and living longer and all that stuff. Well, what does that mean to you if you're living longer, but you're in a lot of pain and you have a lot of fractures or you're sitting in a nursing home with nobody to talk to? These, these are the kinds of things that we don't want to have. So doing the things proactively now, that's what's going to give you the best shot of having that active future and, you know, just thinking that far in advance. Absolutely. I'm always talking about mobility over here. And this is as important, right? We've got to keep our our fascial tissue strong and mobile, but the bones are as important. It's like, you, you know, so it's it's the balance of, of having both. So that's why this conversation is so, so important. Okay, Kevin, let's move on. I want to talk about, because I know everyone's listening. Okay, well, what's causing osteoporosis? What is causing it? Now, I know you mentioned, I want to plus, I talk a lot on here about people taking gluten out of their diet because even if they're not celiac, I am not a celiac. I did, I actually just got my wheat zoomer test back to confirm. And I have, but I am super crazy sensitive to wheat. So like it is not in my diet, has not in my, been in my diet for well over a decade. And it is something that I always encourage people to take out because it's so inflammatory. So regardless of celiac or not, but I, I definitely want to make sure you hit on the celiac piece of it, just from an awareness piece of what, so if someone say they have a diagnosis of celiac or they have say a genetic test that says they could be a, they have like a higher likelihood of becoming a celiac than someone who doesn't have the genetic markers, the importance of that and what that could be doing to their bones. And then of course, addressing just people who are not, and I know you're going to talk about digestion because malabsorption, right? That's where, that's where it's at. (laughs) It's so important. Yeah. So let's even talk about the different types of osteoporosis. Let's distinguish between the two. So there is primary osteoporosis, and that is typically related to a decrease in estrogen in postmenopausal women. Estrogen has a protective effect on bone. As estrogen levels decrease, as they do during menopause, that causes an increase in the activity level of cells that break down bone. But then there's a whole nother cause of osteoporosis, and that's secondary osteoporosis. And that's where it occurs as a result of behaviors, disorders, diseases, medications, and other things. Now, before we get into the specific contributing factors to secondary osteoporosis, we need to talk about peak bone mass. And we need to understand that 90% of your bone mass is put on by the time you turn age 18. And by the time you turn 30, the remaining 10% approximately fills in. So if when you were younger, you had poor diet and nutrition. You weren't getting vitamin D, calcium, magnesium, vitamin K. You ate a bunch of sugary uh, candy and you drank sugary soft drinks uh, and you just had a poor diet. That could be a contributor. If you led a sedentary lifestyle, you weren't playing sports, you weren't doing resistance training, you weren't doing gymnastics, you weren't really active, that could have been a contributor. Uh, you smoked or drank excessively, you had an eating disorder, you took certain medications like glucocorticoids, we'll talk about those in a minute. All of those things could have prevented you from achieving and starting with a peak bone mass and what I call a full bucket. So now now we get into what are the things actively today not just what what we did in the past, but what today could actually be contributing to that bone loss. So there are quite a few things. Medications are a big one. Let's talk about the specific medications that can contribute to bone loss. Glucocorticoid medications. This would be like your prednisone, your cortisone. These are steroid medications that are designed to suppress inflammation. And what they do is mimic natural steroid hormones in the body And they're used to treat conditions like asthma, 
and rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune conditions. And you have to understand if you're on the medication, if you're considering taking the medication, or if you've taken it in the past, it will contribute to bone loss. The reason for that is it decreases your absorption of calcium. It increases your urinary excretion of calcium, leading to a calcium deficit. And the biggest impact here is that these glucocorticoids act directly on the cells that break down bone, the osteoclasts, to increase their lifespan, and that's going to reduce your bone density. Another type of drug that, that's going to have an effect would be um, proton pump inhibitors or your antacid medications. And these are drugs that are designed to reduce the production of or increase the suppression of your stomach acid. Why is that a problem? Well, you need stomach acid to properly break down and extract nutrients from your food like amino acids, the building blocks of protein. Your bones are 50% protein by volume, so they need amino acids. Calcium, magnesium, iron, B12, all of these, if you don't have proper stomach acid, you're going to have a really hard time getting these nutrients. And again, these proton, these antacid medications would be like your omeprazole, your Nexium, your Prevacid, your Zantac, your Ranitidine. Those are the ones that you need to be aware of long-term. It's not going to be good to continue to, to have uh, that level of stomach acid. And a lot of times when people take these medications or they're prescribed these medications, they actually have too little stomach acid instead of too much stomach acid. And there's usually things that can be corrected there and adjusted before you actually get to the point of medication. Another medication, SSRIs selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. These are a uh, class of drugs that are typically used as antidepressants. And there's one review of about 19 different studies on the effect of SSRIs on bone. They have a negative impact on your bone density. They will increase fracture risk. Uh, in terms of the conditions, now let's talk about some of the GI conditions too that can contribute to bone loss. Um, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, so the IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, and then also celiac disease. So celiac disease is that autoimmune condition that when you ingest gluten, it damages the villi in the small intestine. And the villi are like these tiny little hair-like projections in the small intestine, and they're responsible for absorbing the nutrients from the food you eat. What happens is they they take those nutrients and they shuttle them to where they're needed in the body. But if you have celiac disease and you're ingesting gluten or proteins that mimic gluten and you have damage to those villi, I call them your roots, you can't properly extract those nutrients. You can't properly absorb those nutrients. And eventually your body still needs these nutrients to execute its daily functions. So if you're not absorbing them, Where's your bone? Where's where your body going to go? It's going to go to the bones, which is your largest mineral reserve. And that's where calcium, magnesium, all these other ones are located. Um, and then gut health in general is just such a big part of this too. You have to be able to absorb your nutrients. And if you have things like uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, that would be like uh, good bugs, good bacteria, but maybe they're in the wrong place. Okay. Uh, or maybe you have a gut infection or parasites or something like that. Um, or those conditions I just talked about, those could all be contributors. Uh, and then finally, any of the autoimmune, any anything in that autoimmune category or cancer or things like that, we have to understand that if it's creating inflammation in the body, that can contribute to and fuel bone loss. So many things. I'm like, I want to pull apart so many of those, but I also want to stay on task. One thing I want to just kind of reiterate from what you said, and that is because I have a lot of moms listening, and is that is to really the importance for kids and eating and starting them off well. And I know as busy moms, sometimes it's really easy to cut corners and grab fast food and 
things like that. And, you know, from time to time, of course, but it's what are our kids also eating on a regular basis so that we can start them off stronger because today, I mean, I even look from when, you know, we would have been kids, even if we ate kind of the equivalent of the same thing as what, or we fed our kids, like the equivalent of say what we did growing up, it would not be as healthy today just because it's stuff is so much more filled with crap and chemicals and all of that. And so it's just something I always like to remind. And if anyone listening needs that extra little push to just go a little bit, take an extra little couple minutes when it comes to preparing food for family and kids, it's just, it really is that important. And like, you know, for me, I took my son off gluten um, when he was five and it changed his life. And so even if you don't have celiac, but you're reacting to certain foods, you're causing that inflammation. It seems like inflammation is really like the root of so many things, but it's interesting to hear you talk about it with bone health too. So that's very, very interesting. And just a note Um, for kids, for kids too, because I think this is really important because I am, I am do everything you possibly can like prevent, not react. How can we prevent from a younger age? A couple things with kids too. And this applies to us as well, but Kids, I think we really need to be intentional about because it's so easy to just give them a bunch of candy or, you know, sugar and stuff like that. Reducing your sugar intake is key for bone health. The reason for that is sugar damages uh, bone by triggering an inflammatory response. It lowers vitamin D levels. It depletes these bone healthy minerals like calcium, magnesium, chromium, copper, It inhibits intestinal absorption of calcium, and it blocks the absorption of vitamin C. And vitamin C is key for developing and maintaining a healthy skeleton. And this is so important, especially as we're young. So I know it may be tempting and easy and convenient to just grab a sucker or to grab a a ring pop or whatever the candies are these days, but there are so many better options that you can use uh, and just experiment, test things out. One of the things we do, like uh, if our kids are really wanting a dessert or something like that, we do like we have them build their own fruit and berry bowls, like organic fruit and berry bowls with a, with a tiny bit of honey. And you would be surprised at they're still getting the sweetness, but we don't have all the artificial dyes and all the nasty stuff that kids don't need. So we do that at the end of the night, we'll have them cut up a banana in half with a, we call it a tickly knife. It's not really a sharp knife, but it's, we call it a tickly knife. (laughs) Cut up their own banana and they'll build it in this little pretty bowl. And then they'll add some organic berries and now it's colorful. And now we've made this beautiful design and now they're invested in eating better for their own health. And then we give them a little spoon of honey and it just finishes it off and they love it. Um, another thing you could do would be if you have a blender and you're like, okay, maybe they don't like berries or maybe they won't get a little bit extra protein like collagen protein or, you know, something like that. You can add that into a smoothie and then get these little like silicone, they come in different shapes. You can get like silicone hearts. That's what we'd have is we have hearts and you pour the mixture, the protein and like healthy fruit mixture, whatever into the hearts and you freeze them. And then you put them on a plate for dessert and then they can, it just, they love it. They love the coldness and stuff like that. So those are just some ideas that we use too. Those are great ideas. Yeah. For smoothies in our house, my kids put dates in and it's a great way to add sweetness and they get a lot of fiber. Dates are full of fiber. So it's always like, a win-win they get their sweetness and i'm like oh yeah they're getting more fiber so <laughs> another one another one too that i like is uh we get this we we like good quality extra virgin olive oil so we we always use that but we make kale chips my daughter actually requests them but we make uh we use la sonato or dino kale it's a type of kale that's really low oxalate and basically what we do is we put out this baking sheet and we've already rinsed and dried these uh, lacinato kale leaves and we spray them. We've got like this olive oil mister and we spray the tops of the leaves and then we sprinkle it with some sea salt. We put it in the oven. I, I believe it's like 350 for maybe 10 minutes before they turn brown. And But they've got a little crunch to them. You pull them out 
and there you go. You don't have to have chips because they actually really do have a good flavor for kids. Um, this could be a good snack for adults or even teenagers too. Yeah, I'm going to try those. It sounds good. <laughs> yeah, they're really good. Yeah, I love it. I love all the the ideas. Help everybody out. So I'll, I'll give one more, oh, one last yeah. one, and then, then we can move on to the next one. Um, is another easy swap is that if you're putting like, you know, pretzels and potato chips and stuff like that in your kids' lunches, and they still want some kind of crunch or something like that, swap that out for plantain chips. Find some plantain chips or something like that. That's a better swap. So how can we just find these areas where we can make small tweaks and adjustments to get to better? Yeah. And sometimes it just takes baby steps, especially depending on what age your kids are and all of that. Because I know, obviously, the younger you can start, the better. Um, but and I always feel like two with mine because I've got two teens now and one that's entering the preteen that I see that there have been little times where like they kind of veer off because they're wanting to be more independent and try things. But I am seeing that the education I'm teaching them about the foods and why we eat the way we do, because that's I'm, I'm not just saying like, oh, don't eat that because like I never talk about weight or anything. It's always about health and how things are what things are doing for their body. And I I swear to you, like that is the way to teach kids about food because when they really start to understand, then now when they are teenagers and they get the opportunity to eat crap food, they might do it, but then they're like, oh, mom, I don't feel so good, right? So then they start to make those choices and like when they are on their own and they're, they do make better choices, right? It may not be perfect, but you're still in their head. So it really does work. Even when I hear moms say a lot like, oh, well, it's so hard or like, and they feel like their kid's not eating perfect, right? It's, you do have to, depending on their age and the background of how they've been eating, you have to have a little finesse with it. But, um, but it is amazing when you really educate your kids, not just say, oh, you can only eat this, but letting them have choices and letting them be a part of it. I don't know. I love getting talking about kids' health, so I won't go too no, much totally. down a rabbit hole. But I get really totally. This is so important. <laughs> and this is so important, and and to get kids more involved, even or teens, even because that is a big challenge. Yeah. Get them invested in the process. So instead of you just being the individual who comes to them and says, "Hey, we're eating this tonight," or "Try this," reverse it. Have them start at the top of the process where it's meal selection. Hey, what yeah. are your favorite, what are your favorite meals? Why don't we talk about your favorite meals? Oh, you like meatballs and blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. Let's go find, then you go online, you find the healthier version of this, like maybe a paleo version or some other kind of version of this. And then say, Hey, would you eat this? If we made this, it looks good. Does that look good to you? And now they're invested. They've helped in the mm -hmm. process of selection and you're not just telling them what to eat. Do that for the whole week get a whole meals, uh, week's worth of meals done, and then go shopping for them. And now you're going to likely have a better result than if you're just coming to them with your what you picked. Yeah, that's very true. We actually do that in my house. And I, when you say it, I'm like, I don't even realize it. It's become so organic, you know, letting the kids be a part of it. So yeah, great reminders. Okay, let's get back into our osteoporosis conversation. Right, I've got that. so many questions. No, I just, Kevin, I feel like I have so many questions for you. I'm like, we need like two hours, but uh, <laughs> okay. So I want to, I want to talk about like how, because I feel like women are thinking, okay, so if I have osteoporosis or what if I end up getting diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis, like what can I do? Obviously we talked about the things that can cause it. So obviously those are things like if we're on those medications, if there's any way you can work with your doctor to start to decrease them, do more natural things, obviously improving gut health. But what, what else can we do to help improve our bone health as, as we're aging? Well, let's talk about two of the lowest hanging fruit areas. We can talk about nutrition and we can talk about exercise. So let's start with yeah. uh, exercise first. So for exercise, you can do, you can take all the supplements, eat as, eat as many of the, you know, healthy foods that we were just talking about as you want. But if you're not providing the stimulus that your bones need to become stronger, if you're not doing the exercise, the impact is not going to be there. Right? You're not going to be able to build stronger bones and even prevent bone loss. So 
When it comes to exercise, we need two different types of stimuli for our bones. You need muscle pulling on bone and you need impact. The most effective interventions are going to use one or both of those things in combination. And what happens is you've got muscle pulling on bone. It creates a stress. So we've got this mechanical signal sending a chemical signal to tell those bones to become stronger. And then you have impact also. Most people are just told, hey, you can do some walking or do some weight bearing exercise. I can tell you walking by itself is not going to be enough. Okay, It may help you maintain your bone density if you don't have something contributing to bone loss, but it's not going to help you build bone density. Uh, Weight-bearing exercise is important, and these are exercises where your bones and your muscles are working against gravity to keep you upright. They're things that you're doing on your feet, and what that's doing is it's placing this good kind of stress on your bones. So these would be things like you're running, you're jogging, you're hiking, you're dancing, you're gardening playing with the kids uh, outside, you know, climbing stairs, playing soccer. All of those things are weight-bearing. Also weight-bearing would be yoga, Pilates, um, you know, those kinds of things fall into that category. But then we also have non-weight-bearing exercises. And these are activities where you're not placing that good, healthy stress on your bones. This would be your cycling and you're swimming and you're kayaking, especially with swimming too, you're not placing that good stress on the bones. And this is something that astronauts have an issue with when they go into space. You don't have gravity that you're working against. You have no stimulus being provided to your bones. So you can actually lose a significant amount of bone mass and bone density in those situations. Uh, I think the good the good saying is what if you don't use it or you don't use it you lose it you right? lose it yeah um, so what other exercises do we have to incorporate then you have to bring in the muscle strengthening and the resistance training and I do want to make one other note is that if you enjoy cycling and you enjoy swimming it doesn't mean you can't do those things it just means you have to bring in these other forms of exercise too that we're talking about. Because if they make you happy, they reduce your stress, keep doing them. But know that you have to be able to build muscle and bone strength too. So resistance training would be with your heavy resistance bands or even light resistance bands or your barbells or your dumbbells. All of those could even be your body weight if that's providing the stress that you need to build bone strength. Uh, Some of the exercises that can be really helpful squats, deadlifts, overhead presses, um, doing some chin-ups, maybe with some drop landings to get a little bit of that impact there. All those things can be helpful. If those sound intimidating to you, don't let them be because you can find somebody to help you start out in a way that is going to be safe, takes your body mechanics into consideration, and it will help you slowly progress up to where you can actually provide the intensity you need. I love it. Such great advice. We love squats around here, by the way. So I'm Good. always telling ladies, do more squats. And I do love deadlift. Um, okay, so a couple of things you said. You said you mentioned Pilates and yoga, which I loved hearing that because I'm like, I'm not a bone expert over here, but I'm like the fascia movement, pelvic floor mm-hmm. expert, you know. So here's my question. You may or may not fully know the answer to this, but I know you do know some about fascia too. So I teach a lot in a fascial modality in a sense, right? Because I'm always teaching people how to connect through their body. So we are elongating to create more space for our bones. That's what I am really good at doing is teaching people how to create more space. So we don't get the impingement. We don't have the pain, right? So we're working out of pain. So when you're saying, right, okay, we are, we are improving our bone health when we're getting our muscles to pull on the bone, I would assume then when we're doing the fascial training, which is what I'm teaching, I mean, I teach obviously how to strengthen the muscles as well, but I find we become stronger muscularly when we become stronger fascially because we're more connected. So I would assume, please verify this for me, that if we're training the body to be more fascially connected, 
right? So we're creating more space for our bones. We've got more support of our structure. That also is having a positive effect on our bone health. I, I'm going to say yes to that. Okay. <laughs> um, but you're still going to have to, you're still going to have to incorporate these types of exercises that we're talking about and especially the resistance training exercise. Mm -hmm. But yes, I mean, there is a, there is a connection with your fascia. So um, it's just, you have to make sure that you're not just relying on one single thing or one single For exercise. Sure. You want to make sure yeah. we zoom out, look at the whole picture and incorporate the whole spectrum that we kind of talked about there too. Okay. That's no, it's good to hear. Cause I just, uh, like I said, cause we don't do a lot of like bone health conversation, but I'm always trying to get people to have more space between their bones so that they can move their bones more fluidly. So a question I had for you, and I really wanted to talk about this is the relationship of collagen and bone health, because I talk a lot about collagen and fascia because we know fascia is made up of the collagen matrix and bone is also made up of collagen matrix, which I feel like gets totally negated in bone, bone conversation. I feel like always comes back to, Oh, calcium, calcium, calcium. And I'm like, but what about collagen? Can we talk about how we can create more collagen synthesis? in the body, right? That's what it comes down to. So obviously the exercise is part of it, but can you talk about collagen in relationship to bone health? Oh, I'm happy to. Yeah. So collagen is very important for bone health. Uh, just think of this, your, your bones, like I said, they're 50% protein by volume. And a lot of that is it's a collagen protein matrix with minerals that are kind of brought right into that picture. So you have to have collagen. In terms of enhancing or stimulating collagen synthesis, one of the best things to help with that is vitamin C. Vitamin C rich foods are, I mean, everybody knows how important that is for just your health in general, but for bone health specifically, vitamin C is stimulating pro-collagen. It's enhancing collagen synthesis and it's stimulating something called alkaline phosphatase activity, which is a marker for osteoblast bone building cell formation. And that's, that's pretty cool. In addition to that, having collagen in the diet too can be really helpful. Collagen makes up a third of the protein in our bodies. It's the main component of your bones, your skin, your tendons, your cartilage, your ligaments, and you need it for the growth and repair of your cells and tissues in the body. Um, and in terms of, you know, it could be if you're adding like a scoop or something like that, I don't know exactly what your recommendations are, but if you're making a smoothie or however you're incorporating it, into your diet that's a great that can be a great addition yeah i love collagen i actually have my own that i offer because i wanted to give everyone access to a good quality mm -hmm. <laughs> clean no fillers none of that so i'm a huge fan i've been a lover of collagen for a long long time and always recommend ladies uh, to take it because I think, but again, the other piece is you said it and that's vitamin C. We need to make sure we're also getting enough vitamin C to just support our own, our own collagen synthesis. Um, okay. A couple other things I want to talk about just because from the movement perspective, I love talking about movement is what are your thoughts on vibration plates? Do you recommend yes, them? Is that something that like, if some, you're like, if some, if you have access to it or you can get access to it at a gym, like you should go do it every day, do squats on it, stand on it. What are your thoughts of that? Yeah. So vibration plates, there are different kinds too. So it's not like every single vibration plate is exactly the same. There's two, there's two different types of vibration devices that we would talk about. You've got whole body vibration devices. This would be like your power plate, your Galileo, those kinds of ones. Then you've got your low intensity vibration plates, which would be like a Juvent, a Meridine, those kinds of plates. These whole body vibration devices, they've been shown to have a small effect on your bone density. Um, I would say in general, I wouldn't try to, I see some people do this sometimes. I wouldn't try to replace a good workout routine with just using a power plate or something like that, or some other kind of vibration device. There has to be, it has to be a full, well-rounded plan. So view those things as a complement. Don't view them as a replacement. Same thing with low intensity vibration devices. They're great for muscle strength, for balance, could be beneficial for bone, a lot of times, some of those are cost prohibitive for people if they're, if you're upwards in multiple thousands of dollars for a single device. 
Um, so my recommendation when it comes to these vibration plates is prioritize the exercise routine first and then branch out to some of these other complementary devices and technologies once you feel like you have the exercise down and if you feel like it makes sense for your budget. I love it. No, it's great. So ladies, do it if you have it, but don't replace your exercise. <laughs> do not replace yeah. your exercise. For no, sure. I, yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I just have a vibration plate right here that uh, I incorporate. And I love it, if nothing else, for lymphatic flow, right? Because mm -hmm. it just really stimulates your lymph system. So anyway, that's a little side note of a benefit of vibration. So rebounders a, rebounders are also it. great uh, for, oh. for lymph too. Rebounders can also be helpful. For bone? Yeah. Well, for lymph, well, for, what about for bone? Is it enough bone, impacts? For bone, it's... It, it can be um, somewhat helpful. I mean, there's not enough studies really to show that it's going to be, you know, increasing bone density by a specific percentage. So if you're looking for those numbers, those numbers aren't really going to be available. But in gotcha. terms of the, the moving up and down uh, with the force that you're applying there, even though you don't have that hard impact at the bottom, there could still be a beneficial impact on bone health. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is some variety is definitely good. So from an exercise perspective for bone health, what do you recommend out of seven days of the week? Are you, do you recommend that women should do something every single day that is geared towards bone health from an exercise perspective, or is it more like three times a week? What are you seeing that is the most kind of bang for your buck? And I know it, like for me, I'm always telling women, like even 10 to 15 minutes, a day is extremely beneficial for many, many reasons. Where do you kind of stand from a bone health perspective in those guidelines? Yeah. So, I mean, in general, just generally yeah. speaking, movement, you need to have daily movement. So your weight bearing exercises, which would include your walking and things like that, those things can be incorporated daily. Resistance training, you can do that a little bit less frequently. As long as you're reaching the intensity that you need to reach, doing that a couple times a week can be really, really helpful. And you also don't want to overdo it too. It's not like every single day, seven days a week, you being in the gym for an hour long, doing as much as you possibly can, that's going to have a negative impact. Most likely you can overtrain, you can overdo things, not give yourself time to recover. And that's going to actually work against you. So it doesn't have to be every single day of the week. You're doing these hard, intense resistance sessions or anything like that. Yeah, no, I wholeheartedly agree. That's why I teach variety. It's like, if you're going to do HIIT training, maybe you do that a couple times a week, but then you're going to weave in your Pilates and other things throughout the week. So we're getting variety, which is, which is key. Okay, Kevin, I want you to definitely hit on a couple like key nutrition things for people because that's uh, we're eating right a couple meals a day. So what are some of the key nutrition things that we can start to improve someone could start to improve to help her bone health? Besides yeah, adding I mean, collagen, of course. <laughs> yeah. So I would say I would say a couple things. I mean, it's easy for me to just say, Oh, you know, follow an anti inflammatory diet. But Every single person is biochemically and genetically unique. You're going to respond to different foods and supplements and approaches differently. Be patient with yourself as you're testing new things out and just approach it with curiosity and not expectation. Because when you approach, you know, testing new foods and trying new things out with curiosity, you're not going to be disappointed if it doesn't work out or you're going to be less disappointed if it doesn't work out. Okay, so just keep that in mind as you start approaching some of these things. I would say some foods that work really well for a lot of people uh, that I really personally would love to see in a bone health plan, fish. I love fish, but not just any fish. I love uh, the canned fish that have bones in them. So let's get a BPA-free can and let's make sure we've got sardines or mackerel or wild caught sockeye salmon or something like that with the bones in. Now, these okay. bones are not hard, <laughs> pokey bones that are going to hurt your mouth. Okay. These are these bones. Um, I'm not really going to make the case for fish here. I'm, I, I already know it, but they almost melt in your mouth when you, when you eat them. 
these bones almost melt in your mouth. The reason I like these kinds of fish is that they contain three really important things. Number one, they contain protein. You need protein for your muscles. You need protein for your bones. Number two, they contain minerals and not just one specific mineral like calcium. They contain all the minerals that bones need, that your bones need in the right ratios that nature put them in. And then the third one is omega-3s. And omega-3s are a type of fatty acids that are like, they're like the dampeners of inflammation. And anything like we were talking about earlier that contributes to inflammation, especially if it's chronic, especially if it's long-term, that will contribute to and fuel bone loss. So I love having those kinds of fish inside a plant. Another one that I really like, arugula. Arugula is one of my absolute favorite greens. It's a leafy green, same cruciferous family of vegetables as broccoli and kale. It's rich in vitamin C, vitamin K, and bioavailable calcium. All of those are important for your bone health. Uh, it also contains, arugula also contains a compound called aricin, which is a bioactive compound that can help turn off the, uh, the, the activity level of the cells that break down bone. Another reason I like arugula is that it's a bitter food. And our diets today are largely devoid of bitter foods. And the reason we need bitters is that they stimulate our bile. Bile is produced in the liver, it's stored in the gallbladder, and then it helps with digestion. So breaking down and emulsifying fats and helping us absorb those fat-soluble nutrients like vitamins A, D, E, and K. So having those bitter foods in your diet is really, really helpful. The other reason I like arugula is that it's a low oxalate green. And oxalates are anti-nutrients anti that can bind up these bone-healthy minerals. Uh, and if you have issues with, some people really have problems breaking down and degrading this oxalate, so if you've got gut health issues, if you've got kidney stones, if you've got a lot of joint pain, those can be indicators that you have a hard time with oxalate. Swapping things like spinach for arugula would be a great alternative choice there. Uh, so I love those. I talked about vitamin C rich foods, why those are important. We They're great for helping stimulate that pro-collagen and enhance collagen synthesis. And then you've just got great sources of vitamin C rich foods. You've got berries, you've got citrus fruits, you've got kakadu plums, acerola cherries, amla, all of these different ones, uh, camu camu. Uh, and then also you've got different vegetables too. Uh, you've got peppers are one of the best sources of vitamin C. But if you're somebody that uh, has issues with nightshades, like somebody who has an autoimmune condition, you got issues with nightshades. Peppers aren't probably going to be the right fit for you, but you could still do like some steamed broccoli or Brussels sprouts or some of those kale chips that I was talking about earlier. Uh, those things can help you get some additional vitamin C from your vegetables. Such great tips. And arugula is really good as with beets on it. So beet salad with arugula. That's one of my favorites. I love that. Oh, Are you good at so, beets? You like beets? It's so easy to just put to put arugula on a side dish, like a side yeah. plate, put a little bit of uh, dress. I like primal kitchen dressing. That's a good one. It's a healthier option, too. And let's talk about dressings for a minute. A yeah, lot of times, a lot of times salad dressings, uh, they have inflammatory oils in them. They've got soybean oil, canola oil, uh, or some other kind of oil that's inflammatory. You do not want to be consuming these oils. Okay, they're they're not going to do anything good for your body. So how can we make better swaps? Look for your good quality extra virgin olive oil or avocado oil can be a great one to add on there when you've got and I have no affiliation with Primal Kitchen, but um, that's just one that has it's an easy one to grab. You could drizzle a little bit of their balsamic or something on there and it's healthier fats. It's a better alternative. How can we get to better? Yeah, I have uh, lots of Primal Kitchen products in my house and mm -hmm. olive oil, though. That's like my go to on all salads. Yep. And I yep. and I always am telling everybody just use olive oil and some fresh squeeze like lemon, even like that exactly. and some sea salt. Like that's really all you need. I think we've just so many of us have been conditioned to buy these dressings. And I'm like, when you 
just start getting away from them. Like your taste buds will change and you'll be so much healthier for it when we don't get the crappy oils and preservatives that are in so many of the processed. And you don't feel puffy, that that whole puffy Mm. face and you don't feel like, you don't feel inflamed. It's so much better when you're, when you're, you can go a little bit simpler to just try it. So last quick question. I know we're running out of time, but just for women listening who are like, okay, so I've been di- diagnosed with osteoporosis or osteopenia, right? And I'm hearing you talk about the exercise and the nutrition and obviously some of those other things you mentioned that can lead to osteoporosis. So is there hope for her that she can rebuild her bone, even if she's in her sixties and has been dealing with osteoporosis for say a decade even or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there's absolutely hope and progress and improvement are absolutely ho- possible. You can build bone density and improve your bone strength. That is absolutely possible. But before you get to that point, before you start going up and improving, you have to stop going down and losing. So figuring out the root cause issue of that, addressing those things, knowing what lab tests to order, know what the results mean when they come back, know how to have those conversations with the people that are on your team, know if you've even got the right people on your team to help you, (laughs) right? Then nutrition, you got to make sure your diet, your digestion, your absorption are squared away. You got to be taking in the right nutrients in the right amounts. You got to actually absorb those nutrients and you got to make sure those nutrients make it to the cell level. All three of those things have to line up. A lot of times I see, even if somebody's eating healthy, those three things may not be lining up. And the other part of it is it's not just about absorbing your nutrients um, or having an issue with absorption. So if you have digestive issues now and you're listening to this, chances are there's some some things going on with absorption too, right? So if you've got chronic loose stools, that, that's not going to be normal, right? To, so you've got to address the underlying issues here because those digestive issues themselves can be a source of inflammation that contributes to bone breakdown in the body. And then the last part of this is you have to build strength of body, strength of mind, strength of bone. You got to do it in a way that's going to prevent fracture and injury. Not just now, you got to think about the future. So you got to reduce your stress, improve your sleep. It's pretty well documented. Poor sleep will reduce your bone quality. So you got to prioritize sleep. That is one of the biggest... Uh, levers you can pull from a health perspective is improving your sleep. And that's going to do so much exercise. Again, can't take, you take all the supplements and nutrients you want and all the collagen you want. If you're not exercising, it's going to all for naught. Uh, and then the last part of this is, you know, hormones, make sure those are, those are really important part of the picture. And then the other thing I would just say is if you're listening to this right now, and you're concerned about your bone health, or you have a mother or a grandmother or somebody like that, share this episode with them. Don't forget to do this because them listening to this could add years to the end of their life and make those years better quality years. So share this episode with them. Make sure they hear this information because so many people just aren't educated about this and they could end up on a medication that they didn't even need to be on. Um, and, and it could end up being that they're on it for multiple years or for the rest of their life. So, um, I think those are the biggest, the biggest pieces I would say. So well said, you took some words out of my mouth. It's great talking to another podcast host. I'm like, (laughs) just roll with it. (laughs) I love it. Well, Kevin, will you share with everyone where they could reach out to you if they have questions, learn more about your bone coach program and all of that. And I'll, of course, link up anything uh, below in the show notes as well. For sure. Um, So you can always find me at bonecoach.com if you need help or you just want stronger bones resources and things like that. You can always head over there. Uh, follow me at Bone Coach Kevin on Instagram and at Bone Coach on Facebook, YouTube, Pinterest, all those ones. Um, you can always do that. But what I'd like to do, Erica, for your audience, if you don't mind, maybe we could link in the show notes my free Stronger Bones Masterclass. And it's going to walk through the Stronger Bones process. It's an amazing training. Uh, it took me a long time to put this together. So if we could link to that 
that would be such a good starting point for everybody here. Absolutely. Yep. I was planning on it. So I'll put that below. And so everyone can have access to that because knowledge is power. And if we don't know, there's nothing we can do about it. So that's why going and learning yourself for prevention, starting to heal, um, and then sharing with everyone in your life, because that's how we can all help to live, you know, live a healthier life. So Kevin, thank you so much. It's been so wonderful to chat with you. Thanks, Erica.